Do you like wrestling trivia? Then check out the five-star match game, the Pro Wrestling Quiz Show. I'm Joe Gagne, and every episode, I grill three contestants with five rounds of power-packed wrestling trivia. We have over 30 evergreen episodes in the archives covering WWE, AEW, Japan, Mexico, and much, 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 much more. Play along at home and check it out today. Hola, hola. My name is Ricardo. I am the host of the Lucha Jovers podcast here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. We are a Spanish-speaking show dedicated to discussing and analyzing pro wrestling from all across the world. From AW to CMLL, we talk about American wrestling, Japanese wrestling, and of course, Lucha Libre. If something big happened in the pro wrestling world, we will talk about it. So if you know Spanish or have a friend that knows Spanish or want to practice your Lucha Libre pronunciations, go listen to the Lucha Jovers podcast right here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Nos vemos por ahí. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway in a brand new day. Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate for March 14th, 2023. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network feed or on our own dedicated podcast feed on all podcast platforms and applications. You could follow us on Twitter. Uh, if you'd like to donate to the show, click the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our redcircle.com landing site. You click the red box as a sponsor of this podcast, and you can set up a one-time or recurring donation. No obligation whatsoever, but we would like to thank all of our previous donors. I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Mike Spears, joined alongside, as always, Case Lowe. And Case, how are you doing this Tuesday? I'm hanging in there, Mike. I'm doing okay. I got a question for you right off the bat that wasn't on our run sheet, if that's okay. Oh, let's do it. Okay, somebody asked me this earlier today. Not not something that I had thought of. Somebody asked me this earlier today. We were talking about Gran Hamada in a private chat, as you do. And I answered this person pretty quickly. I was pretty definitive in my answer. And hours later, I stand by my answer. But this is something that ever since I was asked and I've been thinking about it, I think it's a very interesting question to ask when you look at Hamada through the lens of a Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Famer, which he's not in, but obviously he should be. This person asked me, and this is what I want your thoughts on. This person asked me, should Hamada get credit for the great careers of so many of his guys, or should he be docked because they mostly did it after breaking away from him? Well, I mean, the obvious problem is that there already is someone who's credited with the careers of his students, and that's Ultimo, and he's in the Hall of Fame. And that is part of his Hall of Fame case, is Toriumon. Yeah, that's that, that's largely what I think. You know, I, I made the other point. I don't think Michinoku Pro has the success, and I want to talk about a, little, a little bit about Michinoku Pro in a second. I don't think Michinoku Pro has the success that it does if everybody involved is a New Japan Dojo castaway in the same way that Ultima was. And, and to a degree, yes, Hamada went through the system, but we don't really think of him as a New Japan Dojo success story. If these guys had all just tried and failed there and then started their own thing, I, I don't think they have the success that they have without Hamada. I, there's, you know, I guess there's a worse possible timeline where Sasuke and Delphin and Dick Togo just end up being juniors on like the FMW roster, or they're just some juniors on the war roster. And I don't think that's any fun. I think Hamada gets credit because we saw the best case scenario, you know, trying to look through the, the crystal ball as much as we can. The universal into Michinoku pro is exactly what all of these guys needed. 
Yeah, and when you talk about like the other options there, FMW, I mean, you had some people from Hamada UWF jumping right to that. You had Gato and Jado yeah. were were members of that, and then they jumped in there and they ended up in WAR. But the thing is, is that there's going to be a lot of bouncing around for the people. I mean, you think of like Dick Togo. Dick Togo is someone who bounced around basically his entire career. So I think that you had this exit ramp that really worked for uh, the Hamada students from in like 93 going to Michinoku Pro and then going right into the Michinoku Pro. Like, I mean, they barely had any buildup before their boom period started to happen with uh, the uh, Tokyo, um, not to, I almost call it Tokyo Gurintai because I was going to say Seki Gun versus Kaintai Deluxe feud. Like the, it was almost like within a period of years that allowed that to happen. And, you know, yeah, you could have seen more of a developed FNW Junior division, but that's not where that company was directed in any sort of meaningful manner. So then it's like, where would they go next? Probably would end up in WAR, and we might see a couple of them, like Masaki Mochizuki, like Taru, like some others, ending up making the jump from WAR to Torimon proper. We were just talking before we started recording about time and how there's there's a number of things that I want to do that I just don't have time for in this in this current state of my life. And maybe six months from now, maybe a year from now, things change. But I, I continue to want to find a way to do a big thing on Hamada's Universal. And I, I'm afraid the thing that's going to jumpstart that progress is Hamada's death. And I don't know if you saw the, the end of Grand Hamada, not dead yet, but I don't know if you saw the video of him. Uh, attempting to cut the ribbon in the dojo that his daughter just opened in Mexico, but he he certainly looks rough. I mean, he's he's an old man who's lived a tough life, and it's it's finally starting to show after seeming ageless for so many years. But I don't think people realize how good the Hamada students are by the time they leave Universal in late '92, early '93. You know, Sasuke and Togo and Delphin in gimmicks that you know they weren't they weren't their fully final form people yet but they're still great and i i, I don't know if people realize that yeah and the that that's part of why i think michinoku pro hit so quickly is you had delphin and sasuke getting there uh, like taka michinoku took a little bit longer but then he was there then you had like all the uh, the seki gun members that kind of went with that uh with Hamada, I it, it's something that I was talking in the former EE Discord actually this last week about Hamada. I, I it, it is something he is someone that I feel like because of just how he worked and when he worked, he does not get the credit or esteem or the roses that he deserved. And it's something that like you talked about him being in rough shape case do you think those rings in toreo were soft whatsoever this guy was just, just like going through it and doing like innovating the style that i would argue vehemently is the precursor to the modern north american style and he was doing it basically in boxing rings like the most unforgiving place to learn this style of wrestling let alone create it no, I mean, the, I, the the point I made to the person I was talking to today was, look, there's Hamada matches from the early 80s. I mean, literally 1980, 81, 82, 83, 84. You could put those matches on Dynamite today and they would get a reaction. And yes, Hamada has a tremendous lucha role, but this is a man who also took flat back bumps like a motherfucker in doing it in those rings in Mexico. I, I can't imagine. It's amazing that he was able to wrestle for as long as he did. And that sort of brings us to Michinoku Pro. And I, I mentioned this a little bit last week, but the 30th anniversary of the first Michinoku Pro show is on Thursday of this week, Mike. Uh, any, any thoughts on that before I kind of get into a little diatribe here? I think that it, it's one of those things that, like, actually last week, case I was looking through stuff for Spears of Asians, and, like, it was J Jensei Shinzaki's 30th anniversary, and they popped a hell of a number. Some of that's Kano returning to the territory and putting it on Wrestle Universe. But it, it it's something with like Michinoku Pro that like, I find it so fascinating. Like this is evidence that a micro indie, a micro kind of micro indie can exist in a very wrestling star area in the country and still kind of like exist and be a, a part of the fabric of the Tohoku region. But then, has these shows like 
Jinzei Sasaki's theory and for sure the space war every year that like re-enter our consciousness that I don't know how many people will recognize how big of a day that is for it to be on Thursday the 16th. Yeah, so at VoicesOfWrestling.com on Thursday, it'll go up at 11 Eastern, 10 Central. I've got the 10 essential Michinoku Pro uh, matches that you need to see if you've never seen them before or if you want to watch them again. And it's not just a straight listicle. I actually go through from Hamada's Universal to Sasuke founding Michinoku Pro, how this promotion came to be, and then the 10 matches of the golden era that you need to see. So uh, the first show is in March of 93. The first match on the list is actually their first Cork and Hall show from February of 94. And I go through there, a bunch of matches in 96, a few matches in 97. And then I end in January of 99 with one of the crazy max matches. And this show was January 10th, which is, Three days before Delphin defected and formed Osaka Pro, it's a few weeks before Torimon formed, and that really changes the meaning of Michinoku Pro from there. Because as I've talked about a number of times, I, I don't think everybody grasped the concept that from day one, Torimon has been a bankable draw. They've always mattered. And January 31st, 1999, their first show, when they come in, they immediately usurp Michinoku Pro as the Lucharesu promotion that matters. Osaka Pro starts in April of 99. They are certainly combative with Michinoku Pro, I think is the fair way to say that. And if you look through the rest of that year, Torimon and Michinoku Pro form a working relationship, while Osaka Pro and CMLL Japan have a working relationship. And although Michinoku Pro in 1999 has that legacy name, the name that matters, the brand that matters, they're the B to the A that is Toriumon in that relationship. And so I spend very little time talking about anything after January of 1999. I, I basically do a big summary of, hey, here's what happens after Toriumon forms uh, Fujita Hayato, Kano, Great Space War, 30th anniversary, here we are. But the story of Michinoku Pro is largely 1993 through 1999. And I have to thank our, our friend of the show, Alan Forel, you know, in 2015 on the voices of wrestling forum alan put together his essential michinoku pro playlist and it has resonated with me eight years later as just one of the most fun viewing projects i've ever done a very formative time for me as a wrestling fan and everything that he sent blew my mind my list is similar to his there's a few different things on there but i i hope that the impact that alan's list had on me I can have for somebody else. So Thursday voices, wrestling.com, the 10 best Michinoku pro matches or rather the 10 most essential Michinoku pro matches. In my opinion, it's, you know, the obvious ones these days, 10, 10, 96, the match that I think you and I think is superior, the 12, six, 96 <laughs> match from Hakata. But then I was about to ask about that. That is yeah. a match that I have written thousands of words about. I've loved it that much. So I'm glad that made yeah. the list. Th there's, there's that in there. And then, you know, again, I don't think most people have seen Michinoku Pro's first first cork and six man. That's the first match on the list. Uh, there's even Onita versus Sasuke, which I don't even think is a great match, but I think it's relevant to the story of the promotion. And then, you know, stuff like the Crazy Max match in 1999, which I say in the piece, and I, I, I'm sure I've said it here, you know, for as great as Shima's career has been, I think the two most interesting time periods in Shima's career are the summer of 1998 through January of 99, right before Torimon forms, and then the summer and fall and winter of 2018 after he leaves Dragon Gate. He's just, he's an animal, however, you know, whatever promotion, whatever period you put him in, but I always thought he was at his best and at his most interesting away from Dragon Gate and away from Torimon. So I recommend, I, I assume most people haven't seen the Crazy Max match that I linked. It's, uh, it's, Shima, Fuji, and Sua versus Hoshikawa, Yakushiji, and oh, uh, I I can't think of the other guy's name. He ended up in Osaka Pro. This is like the last match he worked for Michinoku. Um, you'll see it. You'll see it on the article. But it, it's I spent a lot of time on it. I think people are going to enjoy it, and I think it's worth celebrating that. You know, I don't. I didn't realize this until I started doing research for the project, Mike. It's not only a regional indie. It was the first promotion in Japan that was f based outside of Tokyo. And obviously others have followed suit, Dragon Gate being one of them based in Kobe. But everything prior to 1992, October of 92, when Sasuke formed Michinoku Pro, 
was based in Tokyo. Yeah, like that's like the thing about Michinoku Pro that I've always found so endearing was the fact that they chose the different path straight out of the gate. And is that 99 match? I'm trying to remember the venue because I think I know which one you're talking about. Is this the venue with like the uh, kind of glass on the hard cam side where everyone sits in? Yeah, I think it's okay. in Sendai. Sendai, um, yeah. Yeah, I forget what it is, but I know it's in Sendai. It's one of my favorite venues whenever I see it popping popping up. Like, you didn't really see it in Torimon, but whenever you watch Michinoku Pro, it is one of the regular haunts of theirs. Yeah, th- so like I said, it's it's Hoshikawa who you know, became brilliant in Osaka Pro and then became brilliant in Zero One before he got hurt. It's Masato Yakashiji, who is definitely one of your guys. And then... The other guy in the match is uh, I'm, now I'm going to butcher his name here, and this is why I almost didn't want to find it. But uh, Dio Qualty, who was yeah, Dio Qualty, yeah, yes, uh, uh, Masaru Seno in Michinoku mm-hmm. Pro. That is the sixth guy in that match, and and it's look, it's a very low quality video. I think it's in 240p, but it is worth looking through the grains of film to watch because it is pretty spectacular. Oh. I, I have to say this case, it's not through the grains of film. It's through the grains of magnetic tape because I bet that's like a fourth generation VHS rip. Okay. All right. Um, I, I'm an archivist. Now, 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 I'm that an archivist. Off, now that you're off your soapbox, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I, you know, I think there's, I, I can't imagine any women listen to this show, period, but they certainly logged off after that fucking dork spiel. Do you have, do you have anything else to add on Michinoku Pro, Mike? <laughs> No, let's talk about Memorial Gate this week. <laughs> Sorry, that was mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. So there was no uh, televised Dragon Gate shows, as y'all are well well versed. We'll talk about some of the other happenings of the week. But the big thing was the card for Memorial Gate came together throughout these YouTube shows. It is this Saturday, the 18th in Wakayama from Wakayama Prefectorial Gym. 1 a.m. Eastern start. It, it will be... It, it, it's going to be single cam. It seems like I haven't seen anything from Jay to indicate he's heading out to Wakayama. Uh, Case, before we get into this card, we should probably, for people who might be their first Dragon Gate podcast, might be not their first Dragon Gate podcast, but they not might not have been around for Memorial Gate. How would you describe Memorial Gate for the, for the newcomer to Dragon Gate? A show that means more for the corporate entity of Dragon Gate than it does to the fans of Dragon Gate? Right. So this the show has its basis actually in the Torimon era because they used to be doing these West Japan tours and they would release cor- uh, commercial tapes called Uno, Dos, Tres. But this is, I don't know if it's still this case right now, but for the longest time, this was a bot show by the um, the local station affiliate of MBS. That's not Muhammad bin Solomon. That is the Mayanichi Broadcasting System, who is a owner of Gayora. So this is all. So traditionally, this was a show that was only aired locally up until I think 2017, or actually until the network. This was not a show that ever made live streaming, but now it is, and it, it's a show that has a particular bent. In case we do have one match being missed out here, that is the Wakayama Tornado winner and tag we do not have one of those coming up this year that's a bummer that was a, a nice little sort of tradition that they stumbled into i think in 2020 and then 2021 and did they do one last year no they did not because i will i want to get into last year's card for a second the atrocity that was memorial gate 2022 so you know no super fun multi-man match on this show but i think it is a super fun card overall and that is so much better than last year, which did 285 fans. This was February uh, 23rd, 2022, did 285 fans compared to a year prior, which did 485. And then the one in August of 2020 that did 370. This is the only, I, I, I will label it a marquee event that I can think of in Drangate that went down, you know, 2020 to 2021 went up and then went down 21 to 22. And it, it, when you look at this card, it makes sense just to kind of remind people of what we got last year as a reason to get excited about what's to come this weekend. Last year's card was Shimizu, Susumu, and UT 
versus BB Hulk, Kai, and uh, Shun Skywalker. Ho Ho Luna, Takashi Oshida versus Strong Machine J and Sashi Hoko Boy. Diamante and SB Kento versus Punch Tamanaga and Yosuke Santa Maria. That went 34 seconds. Ben K, Kagatora, Dragon Kid, Kaisuke, Okuda, and Yamato versus Don Fuji, Masaki Mochizuki, Shuji Kondo, Ultimo Dragon, and Yasushi Kondo, or Kondo, rather. A five way match between the rookies of Takuma Fujiwara, Ishin Ihashi, Riki Ihashi, Ryufuda, and Takumi Hayakawa. And then a original gold class six man, Ashita Minora and Doi versus Genki, Kamei, and KZ. Hyo versus Eita in the semi main. And then a thrown together twin gate main event that had no build whatsoever of Dragon Daya and Yuki Oshioka versus Jason Lee and La Estrella. That was the show last year. That show deserved 285 fans. Yeah, so like that is kind of the context of which we really should look at these Memorial Gate cards. Usually there's one or two title matches, but for the most part, it is a card for the local fans that they would air on TV. Don't know if that's still really the case with that, but I just have to say, just looking at the card for this Saturday, just top to bottom, much stronger card, a lot more interesting of a card in case, unless you had any other big points, I'm going to run down the card for us. No, I'll I'll just mention really quick, you know, 2021 had a Dreamgate match and a Twingate match. The Dreamgate match being that excellent Shun Skywalker versus Kazuma Sakamoto match. Th- there wasn't anything else too appealing on that show. I remember there being a, a disappointing Ben K versus Hip Hop Kakuda match. And then 2020 was obviously Doi versus Ata in a match that was certainly worked and treated like it was the original Kobe World main event had COVID not happened. And that was that was a pretty loaded show. So they go through phases where this show matters, and they go through phases where it's a throwaway. This year, there's certainly a lot more focus on it w- than there was the prior two years. Yep, and we see that straight from the jump as they are opening with the Open the Triangle Gate Championship match. It is the champion team of Gold Class, Benke, B- uh, Baby Hulk, Kota Minora with Minorita versus the challenging team Don Fuji, Kaito Nagano, and Yoshiki Kato that was formed during the weekend's YouTube shows. Match two, the original tag team, Susumu Mochizuki. Well, let's, go, let's go match by match here. I, w- okay. I want to know your thoughts on this Triangle Gate match. Who's coming out ahead here? Well... With the entire storyline about Minorita just just in a outright funk here, one can see like, oh, Kato has been scoring falls nonstop. The Crescent Backbreaker, as it's now called, has been brought back out. He's been doing, he's renamed the Bloodfall, the Moonfall. And it looks like he's starting to have people's numbers, but it is still something where I look at this rookie team and I think that it's more of a storyline thing that Don Fuji is teaming with Nakano and Kato after what Mochizuki Jr. is going through more so than this being like a true challenger team that's going to take the belts away from gold class. I'm with you. I I don't see any reason for gold class to lose here. It'd be super exciting if Fuji, Nagano, and Kato won the belts, but I I don't see a reason for it. What what I'm going to be looking for in this match, and it comes from the YouTube shows where they did Nagano and Kato versus Minora and Minorita. We our eyes go to Ben K in matches like this. We go, oh, what can Ben K do against a smaller wrestler like Nagano? Kota Minora, when he wrestles small wrestlers, he is so violent. I mean, he drilled Ho Ho Loon a few weeks ago. He was really really aggressive with Nagano over the weekend. That is something that I, I'm noticing a developing trend there, that when Minora really has sides, when he can impose himself on somebody, he does it in a, a sort of jarringly violent way. And I would really like to see him abuse Nagano and then see Kato coming for the same. I, I think the dynamics there could be very interesting, but ultimately, I see Gold Class retaining. Yeah, that YouTube match was by far was one of the few like really things that kind of reached out and got me was how how vicious uh Mino was against uh uh Nagano with that and it'll be interesting to see that uh I just like look at this team and I wonder like ultimately it's going to come down to Hulk who did not have a good weekend I'd argue given the YouTube stuff here and with some stuff with Kato I just have issues with him and that and that's going to be like if we're working for like a possible like problem point something that they could fail the exercise with it's going to be that parent 
because I what I saw in the lead up did not give me a lot of confidence. That you you just think Hulk is too broken down to work the physicality that Kato needs to succeed. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's ultimately what it comes down to. And there were some other things like with Kato. Kato did not have an easy weekend. Now that I'm looking at, at it, he, he a lot of punch Tomonaka going on there. But match two uh, is the original tag team. Susumu Mochizuki as Sushi Kondo versus Sachioko Boy and Takashi Yoshida. The, the, they're on the loop. You know, Yoshida gets booked. Yeah, look, that's that's a Memorial Game match right there. Absolutely. So uh, we have one that's distinctively not a Memorial Gate match as we're going to dip back into Natural Vibes versus Z-Brats as it's Jason Lee, Jackie Funky Kame, and Ho-Ho Loon, actually Kung Fu Masters more so than uh, a Natural Vibes versus the Z-Brats team, Shun Skywalker, Kai, and Hio. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. You know, Ho-Ho is going to eat an SSW or a Moonsault uh, knee press. So w- whatever it is, he's taking the fall here, but there's no reason that this match shouldn't be anything less than a very good time. Yeah, and when I look at it, I you also now have the potential of, and in no case you might be a loathe to say to see this. Can't discount the Bobby Hill special for Hyo and him making a brave challenge. I think they're going in a different direction with the Brave Gate belt, uh, and there's there's a lot of plotting for the future we can do between this show and the Nagoya card, which I want to go over in just a second with you as well, because I I think Dead or Alive is going to come into focus real quick this weekend. Well, they have six weeks. It's like the perfect amount of build, I think, for a major show is six weeks. I keep on going back in my head to like the first pay-per-view loop that AEW did with Dynamite leading into that first full gear when it was six weeks of show and everything kind of like was heading beat by beat by beat by it. I think this week they could really get together and we'll, and I feel like it'll be something that will be really good for the uh, Dead or Alive card or the Road to Dead or Alive, the fact that things aren't going to really... They're going to get enough time to breathe, but they're not going to get a chance to stagnate, is what I'd say. I'll, I'll say this. I will be super disappointed, super disappointed, if we leave this weekend with no clear sign of what is to come at Dead or Alive. And I, and I think for as strong as the booking of this promotion is, I, I am noticing... A real, a real rush nature to some of this booking, which I, you know, on one hand has has worked out favorably, but you know, I I just I I get concerned sometimes that it's not that I don't think there's long term thought being put in; it's that we're not seeing enough long term angles play out, and that used to be such a strength of Dragon Gate is we would have these these quite lengthy builds of these matches, and we don't really get that anymore. Things almost move too fast in this promotion with all of the title changes, some of the unit uh, changes that I've seen. I just, I really want to be able to savor this Dead or Alive build. I want it to be six weeks. I, I want to have an idea coming out of here. And I, and I think if things go the way that I do, I think very realistically, the Dreamgate match, the Twingate match, and the Bravegate match for Dead or Alive can all be ushered into motion this weekend. That's what I'm really hoping for. That's that's my goal. That is what I would do here. At the very least, I think we've got to have a direction for the Dreamgate match, and if there's going to be a cage match, maybe sprinkle some of those uh, uh, hints in there as well. And speaking of Nagoya, one of Dead or Alive's favorite sons is in the singles match, Dragon Kid, native of Nagoya, going against Strong Machine J in the singles match here. Strong Machine J definitely from the... For, from the stuff that's made tape and the YouTube uh, screening since then, has kept up the uh, the sheen of being a Dreamgate challenger. The, his step up, like his challenge there, has not been mitigated over after the loss from Shun Skywalker, in my opinion. So what do they do here? Because Dragon Kid doesn't take a lot of falls. He's very protected, as he should be. But Strong Machine J probably can't lose on two big shows in a row. Do do they give Strong Machine J the win here? What what do you think the story is? I think that if there has to be a finish between the two of them, it has to be Strong Machine J. I mean, Dragon Kid is pretty Teflon. Like, he could take a loss, and it's not going to change anything about him. 
Oh, I, yeah, that that I completely agree with. It. I just, it's strange in a good way. It's strange in a way that makes me think, but it's a guy who doesn't lose a lot wrestling a guy that needs a win. And that's always an interesting position to be in. And I, and I think a win here would do Jay a lot of good. I think it's going to be an interesting match for Strong Machine Jay because you think about the singles matches that he's had. It's Ata and it's Skywalker and it's Ben K largely, some of the bigger wrestlers on the roster. Here we're going to see him with a distinct size advantage, a distinct power advantage. I, I assume this is going to deliver, but it's it's interesting on paper, and I think the result is up in the air, even if I think Strong Machine J will ultimately get the win. And there's also the aspect with Strong Machine J, yeah. the fact that he is in natural vibes, but really, since joining, he has not really found a pairing like how Jackie and Jason found each other uh, big time. He is a little apart here. So, like, having him in these singles matches does seem to be a little bit of an intentional thing. We all thought Dragon Kid was heading straight for D-Courage. Is there a chance that Natural Vibes grows even bigger and that Dragon Kid finds his way into the unit, the seventh member of Natural Vibes? I mean, Dragon Kid is going to be an option for every unit until he retires. Yes. Every face unit. Like, that's just a matter of the landscape. He is the promotional mascot for the last 25 years. He will be it until he retires. So he could. I, I mean, with the exception of the fact that UT and his injury issues, it's not like Natural Vibes is starving for new members. <laughs> like, maybe as a statement for UT's health, you want to bring in Dragon Kid to the other Nagoya guy, but... I look at the, the units and I look at how the landscape is and Dragon Kid is much more needed elsewhere. Yeah, I, I, that's that's where I'm at. It, you know, but you throw out the idea of, well, does there need to be a finish in this match? And, you know, if Shun Skywalker and Kai and Hyo come out and, and double team these guys and cause a double DQ, all of a sudden we have momentum headed in the Dragon Kid, the natural vibes direction. It's not what I want. It's not what I do. But I I also think it can't be ignored. Yep, and speaking of the other option, D-Courage is in match number five. The full complement, Yuki Oshioka, Dragon Dai, Madoka Kakuda. They are going up against the veteran part-timer team, Naruki Doi, fresh off of his All Japan uh, title defense and interesting partnership, uh, and Shuchi Kondo and Ginki Horiguchi. And, well, we know what the finish is. It's Horiguchi is going to eat a fall here, but... I, it yet they keep doy with condo and i find that fascinating i think the betting odds favor is that horiguchi takes the fall but don't sleep on the rookie doy you know they're they're in a pattern right now where yoshioka is taking a lot of falls and it's not hurting him they're obviously protecting kuta they're obviously protecting daya yoshioka is the one that is taking the brunt of the losses right now and you know, he's the one that took the falls in the tag league when he was teaming with kuta I wouldn't be surprised if Doi pins Yoshioka here. And I mean, that would at least keep a lot of other companies happy. It would keep a lot of other companies happy. I also think it would play into future Dragon Gate plans, TBD, more in just a second when we talk about Nagoya. And then we have our first of two title match semi-main event, the Ryukyu Dragon Ryo Championship Yamato, not Dragon Gate Yamato, Perpetually tired Yamato going against Teal and Shisa. This, of course, was set up last week on the Corkin show. I, I'm I'm sure this will be fine. I you know I I I'm sure it'll be fine. That that's about all I got here. Yamato, even though he's defending another company's title, he has to kind of be at this position on the card, especially on a show like this one. Main event, big time. We'll be defending the Twin Gate Championships against the M3K team. It's the Mochizuki, it's Masaki Mochizuki, and Ms. Mochizuki Jr. This is coming off of the Hiroshima match where, uh, yeah, was it Hiroshima? Or no, I'm sorry, it was Himeji match where M3K got a fall onto uh, reversing the sky to schoolboy Mochizuki did in order to make that challenge here. And Case, our, our dreams are realized. We're not doing away with the Mochizukis just yet. No, I, I'm really into this. I'm kind of curious to know from your perspective on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, excitement level, where are you at here? 
oh i'm an eight i love this match <laughs> like given how much fun the mochizukis were during Rey de parejas putting them in this this scenario here where junior the person who has like pocket aces throughout his life and his career so far i i, I don't bet against them and it's going to be a, a great matchup i mean who is a who has better chemistry with kz than masaki mochizuki case it's funny you say that because i was going to ask you who has better chemistry with shimizu than masaki mochizuki right so i mean like this is one of the ones where we're instantly writing four and a quarter in our notebook and we're seeing if we're going to need to mark that up you know like this is a match that given this show it will probably get 15 to 20 minutes so this is going to get time nothing's going to get rushed here even though it's an earlier start i mean that this is the match of the weekend i would say go out of your way to make some time for i mean it's gonna be one o'clock on sun on saturday so you you would have the rest of the full day of the weekend basically to catch this if you aren't watching this live yeah, I, I'm really intrigued to see what this show does at the box office because you've got Yamato in a singles match in the semi-main event, and you've got a tag match that I know I'm certainly into, and as I've discussed on this podcast numerous times, I am led to believe from people that were buying tickets in the Tokyo area that Mochizuki Jr. really started becoming a draw in the summer of last year when they started doing the program between he and Ishin, who was noticeably absent on this show again. But, you know, last year they did 285, which is embarrassing low. I would certainly think they surpassed that. I am really curious to see if they can surpass the 485 that was done in 2021. Now, for perspective, 2021, 485, that was Skywalker versus Sakamoto for the Dreamgate in the main event. To look at what they were doing pre-COVID, they did 936 fans for Susumu versus Dragon Kid for the Brave Gate match in, or for the Brave Gate belt in 2019. I, I certainly think it's possible that they fall in the middle there, and that would be a giant win for the company if they do. I think if they even are flat with 2021 at 485, I think they would take that as a win, and I think the main event is big enough to do that. So I'm excited, and I also I think we're getting new Twin Gate champions. It's something where I feel like that this could be a interesting exit ramp. And I think that with Mochizuki Jr. and with Masaki Mochizuki, you can naturally, with the stuff that's happened, have Don Fuji uh, really liking this Yoshiki Kato guy and putting something together there. And th there's a path forward for this. Like, like you could see where a Mochizuki Mochizuki tag team uh, Twin Gate run has more legs than just like one single defense like you could do a lot with that uh touching on attendance the one thing that like we talked about this last week that i still feel like it's worth stressing uh, is we don't know when the what the ticket allotment was when the restrictions were lifted for noise crowds so they could still be operating under something that doesn't allow them to reach out at 450. Uh, well i is it okay? So they reached that in 2021, but is there? A, are you saying? And I, I forget all of the rules. Does the setup prevent them from possibly reaching that maximum total even two years after that? I would think that they should be able to get that 400 or so. But getting past what they have done, I don't think they can break 500 with the, with that. However, I think that in the future, there's no reason to believe they wouldn't be back in the 800s interesting okay yeah that 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 confuses me and you know we've talked it confuses about this. me to be honest well but. it's like from 2021 onwards you could see year over year growth or decline and it was all relatively simple and as we go back and you know unfortunately people like you and i are going to have to remember this sort of stuff for history and go back and have these conversations and it, it makes sense when you see year over year growth, 2020, 2020, 2021, 2022. But when you move into 2023 and there's still some of these early shows that are cheering shows, but their attendance capped, that's, that's where it's going to lose me or where we're going to forget about this, you know, five years from now when we're discussing it, that's confusing. And I, I'm only bothered by it from a historical perspective, but it is a little confusing. No, I, I hear you about that. Well, okay, so we talked some of the YouTube stuff. Was there anything from this weekend from Himije, uh, Hiroshima, and Totomi that kind of reached out to you they want to spend some time on? 
No, I actually want to talk about this Nagoya show on the 19th for a second. All right, let's do that instead. Okay, I'm I'm annoyed that this show isn't on the Dragon Gate Network. I, I wish they would add this to the network loop. It was broadcast on the network in December. I think the August show last year might have been as well. This is the Nagoya Congress Center. We did a big episode last winter, like November, December-ish, whenever the last Nagoya Congress Center show was, talking about how in this market, Dragon Gate is so clearly the number two, and they are probably closer to New Japan in Nagoya than any other town, any other city in the country. It's very interesting to look at just how well Dragon Gate does here. Obviously, Ultima Dragon's hometown, Dragon Kid's hometown, SB Kento's hometown. There's a lot of hometown pride there. And, of course, the 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 city and the prefecture for Dead or Alive. So I have three large points I want to make, and I would almost hate to get people's hopes up because, quite frankly, I think these are all such good ideas, and it's not fantasy booking. I think it's very realistic to approach this card with these things in mind. I want three things to happen, Mike. Are you ready for these? Let's do it. All right, main event, Yuki Yoshioka, Dragon Daya, Madoka Kakuta versus Shun Skywalker, Kai, and Hyo. There is no reason whatsoever that coming out of this show, Kakuta versus Skywalker should not be booked for the Dead or Alive main event. It is on a platter for you. It is in the same town that Dead or Alive is taking place in. Use the ramp that you've got that's been provided to you by the gods of scheduling and let's get Kakuta versus Skywalker on paper confirmed for May 5th. Are you good with that? Oh, yeah. And especially considering that they will still have the, all of April's loop, which probably means one more appearance in Nagoya. I need to go look at the cards for that. They could easily make this to be like, look at this town. This is what we're doing here. Come back in six weeks and see Kakuta go for the title. This is actually, I'm looking at the April schedule right now. This is going to be their last stop in... Uh, both Aichi and Nagoya before Dead or Alive. So if you're going to shoot a big angle, you got to do it on this show. Oh, yeah. Next, it's the Kunamoto show that throws me off for for April. And we have uh, Bude and Zero coming up. So, yep, that's part one. I, I totally co-sign on that. They should. It makes too much sense not to do. Semi-main event. Maximum members collide. Dragon Kid and Naruki Doi, who were an excellent tag team, in 2018 2019 versus kz and jason lee you remember what i said earlier about hey don't sleep on naruki doi getting a fall here don't sleep on naruki doi getting a fall here as well i think we're approaching doi versus jason lee for the brave gate belt at dead or alive and that would be a good thing to cash all those chips on letting doi you know get all these wins here it's like well Yep, you're part-timing, so you're getting these wins, but we expect you on 5-5 five five to lose the title match. First of all, think about how good that match would be. 2023 oh, Naruki absolutely. Doi versus Jason Lee. Oh my god. Mm-hmm. I also think, politically, and I don't know if they have to worry about this or not, politically, I think it satisfies both Dragon Gate and All Japan to have Doi wrestling for the Brave Gate belt instead of the Dream Gate belt, because Doi is Braves All Japan Junior Champion. I don't know if that matters or not, but I I certainly think it it doesn't hurt to have him in this position. Does that make sense? Yeah, and why is he a preferred freelancer if you're not able to put him in matches you want him to be in? Completely agree. And then you know the final point here. Do you know off the top of your head the last time Naruki Doi wrestled for the Open the Brave Gate Championship? Was it when he defeated Shima for it and briefly was a double champion for like 24 hours? It was a little bit later than that. So that that was 2009. That was Kobe World 2009. And then he wrestled Pac for the Brave Gate belt at Dead or Alive 2011 and lost. He wrestled Ricochet for the Brave Gate belt at Champion Gate in Osaka 2012 and lost. The last time, and I, I was surprised, I thought it would have happened much more recently than this, like in the last five years. The last time Doi wrestled for the Brave Gate belt was August 1st, 2013, in Korokin versus Masato Yoshino. Yeah, well, you know, he got married. 
And, you know, when you get in those kind of relationships, you're not watching your waistline as much. Maybe 83 kilos is something that has not been a modern Naruki toys problem in several years. Brother, don't I know it. My girl, my girl be trying to fatten me up. I keep on saying, oh, yeah, I need to lose some weight, need to eat better. She's like, no, you don't. No, stay big. <laughs> going, oh, God. <laughs> this is almost intimidating at that point. So I think we're going to leave with Kakuta versus Skywalker and Doi versus Jason Lee. I feel pretty confident in those, quite frankly. The third part of this, the third thing that, yes, I want it to happen, but I also genuinely think is going to happen in Nagoya. I can't keep my eyes off of match three, which is Punch Tamanaga and Hoho Loon versus Masaki Mochizuki and Mochizuki Jr. I look at these two here. I see they're teaming together. Shimizu's wrestling Konamami Chikawa. KZ's in the aforementioned semi-main event. They're at this point, look, they don't have to team together on every show, but they're on such different wavelengths here. I think it's a natural conclusion for them to lose the belt at Memorial Gate, whereas the Mochizukis are still teaming. I think that's going to be a quick match. I think they're going to buzzsaw through these guys. And I think we're going to see the returns of SP Kento into Kuma Fujiwara, SP Kento's hometown, a proven draw in this market before he left for Mexico. I think at Dead or Alive, we're doing Kento and Fujiwara versus Mochizuki and Mochizuki Jr. That's where you lose me. Really? Okay. I think Kento's coming back for a bigger station than just doing Twin Gate matches, and especially with Dead or Alive, the fact that there is always the looming specter at the cage. So I, I, I was on board with this thought process basically up until the last week. I, I, I'm struggling because, you know, the, the problem is that it seems like Kento and Fujiwara are going to be together. I would be very surprised if they come back apart. And I don't think either of them are going for Brave Gate belts when they come back. So you can have Kento wrestling Skywalker and then Fujiwara just doing whatever, or vice versa. I think when they come back, I think they're going to be together. Quite frankly, I just think their tag team worked too well in Mexico to ignore, and they have clearly bonded to a point that you can't ignore. And so when they come back, I think they're coming back together. And while I think you and I both go, well, it's SB Kento, he should be wrestling for the Dreamgate belt. I, I agree. But isn't a more uh, favorable position for him being winning the Twin Gate belt in his hometown? I mean, winning the cage and then being on the road to Kobe World, I would argue, is bigger. Yeah, but then you gotta you gotta re, you gotta get him back into the fold. You gotta find a reason for him to be in the cage, and then you you know who is uh, other than maybe Hyo, but that feels you know. That feels rushed. If it's SP Kento and X in the cage and it's the last two and the loser, you know, the person that doesn't escape gets their head shaved, let's say, is Hyo the X? Is that enough time to tell that story? You have to have SP Kento return and then return against Hyo. And then you have to have these guys in a cage match with probably four other people. It just seems like a lot of hoops to jump through where, again, this kid is not 25. There's going to be... There's going to be time to tell that story. There's going to be next year to tell that story. I think this puts him in a more favorable position. This has him hit the ground running in a way that I actually think is more favorable than a cage match Dreamgate opportunity. I don't know. I look at how they've booked into people when they get that push, and it is always around some sort of return or turn going straight into a title program. That's what happened with Shun Skywalker returning from Mexico. That's what happened when when Yamato turned face, when BB Hulk turns face, there, when Binke turns face. There is a path for that, and the ultimate path is SB Kento babyface winning the Dream Gate at Kobe World. And if you think that there is a year because of time, I get that. I just think that this is a company that has always wanted to strike while the iron is hot. This isn't Akira Tozawa coming back where you need to kind of re- the, because his station was so low when he left, you have to acclimatize them to it. SB Kento was main eventing in this building as a 21 year old. I think that you, I, I don't think he needs that year to acclimatize. And Hio is someone that not three weeks ago we were talking about him 
already being like the odds on favor to be losing his hair to begin with. I think what's different here is Shingo goes to America. He's alone. Hulk goes to America. He's alone. Yamato goes to America. He's alone. Tozawa goes to America. He's alone. T-Hawk and Aita go to Mexico and they come back together. Similar situation here, SP Kento and Fujiwara. They're they're not alone in this battle. They left around the same time. They're going to come back around the same time. And I think, you know, I, I, I would certainly hope, I will say, that the Dragon Gate office is clued into the work they've done in DTU as a team, the work they've done in Big Lucha as a team. You can't, or I'm sorry, not uh, Big Lucha, but AAA. You can't ignore that. And you've got, again, basically a built-in Millennials 2.0, which carries some weight to it, both good and bad. But I think you have to lean into that. Look, I I, I would have strapped up SB Kenton with a Dreamgate belt instead of having him go to Mexico. But now I'm in a position where I think they've got something with this team. And I think if you can savor this and you can have a summer where you're running Kento and Fujiwara versus the Mochizukis and Kento and Fujiwara versus Yoshioka and Daya, the original D-Courage, and you can have Kento and Fujiwara versus Big Time and Jason Lee and Jackie and Shun and Diamante. I think you want that. I think there's plenty of time for SB Kento and Akuma Fujiwara to get to the top of the mountain. And as I've said before, the money is in heel Takuma versus babyface Kento at Kobe World. That is the crescendo to end all crescendos when we talk about the future of Dragon Gate. That is the one that I have my sights set on. But there's time. Give these guys the Twin Gate belts. Let these guys let these guys continue the great work that they did in Mexico on a bigger and better platform. I think that's the move here. And because of the way it's set up with the Mochizukis versus... A, a nothing tag team with all due respect to Ho-Ho and Punch. It's not exactly uh, the great tag team that is roll up or shut up. It's Ho-Ho and Punch, unfortunately. And with this being an SB Kento's hometown, like I said last week, they they just have to run back the angle that they did with Kakuta when he returned in Kanazawa last year. He shows up at this show and all of a sudden he is, you know, got a microphone in his hand. He's, an, he's in an angle with Zebrats. And we're off to the races. Now, it took Akuta a little while to find his footing in Japan. I don't have that same fear for Kento and Fujiwara, but I do think this is the way to go. I just, I think that with how special they've been with this building, that he, that you having his big return in his hometown be leading up to a Twin Gate match when he's already main evented Dead or Alive, it seems like that that is cooling him down intentionally on his return when I think that the company has shown a propensity to have it be full throttle. And that would be surprising to me, but that would be something that that's not considering Takuma Fujiwara. When I say that though, whereas Takuma Fujiwara coming back right into the, the twin gate picture, that's exactly where he should be. You know, like he's 22, put him in that picture makes perfect sense. So the, the, your logic is not off there. I just think that the one thing that, that to me, I just can't get over is just, cooling off SP Kento on his return. But on the other hand, Fujiwara, it's exactly where he wants to be. Maybe they think, all oh, right, uh, we have so much time here. Let's let uh, Kento do this for the next year and your plan. And I, I, I can buy that, I guess. I, again, I, prior to this past week, I, 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 saw, I saw your side of the argument, but I don't think, coming back and wrestling for the Twin Gate belts against Masaki Mochizuki and his prodigy son is a step down. The, the other thing that I think is interesting is if that's the direction that they go, we haven't seen either of these guys wrestle Mochizuki Jr. Maybe SP Kento has a little bit because Kento left at the end of July and Jr. debuted in June. But Fujiwara and Jr. is entirely unexplored territory, and I, I think that's really wow. interesting. Oh, absolutely. So I, I am with you on seeing what Junior can do, especially when you talk about class of 22 versus class of 21 and class of 2020 happening right there. You know, I mean, that's basically that, that that's basically the future era put on display with the longest tenured person on the roster. And I think that's something that is incredibly interesting, to say the very least. I'm with you. So so good stuff there. Look, Memorial Gate, I think, is going to be a fun show at the very least. The Triangle Gate match should be great. The Twin Gate match should be great. Undercard is, you know, certainly a mix of things here and there. And then, 
you know, as of the time we're recording this, this Nagoya show is not on the network, but it will be on YouTube in some some form or fashion. And I would assume we get uh, the semi main, the doy match, and the main event, the D Courage versus Z Brats match at the very least. And if there's a big angle with SB Kento, that will obviously get put on YouTube as well. So a lot to look forward to this weekend uh, in the context of Dragon Gate. Absolutely so. And something when we talk about these young wrestlers and Mochizuki Jr. being so recent into the his career that, you know, we're talking about him like being a double champion. He would have two champions before he has reached his one year anniversary case. I proposed something to you before we started planning the show that we've kind of changed this around here. But I like the way we're going this. We're going to talk about the rookie classes and the great rookie classes of the Dragon System. Because when we, when we last week, we're talking about this class here and some of the things. Well, the, there was some feedback about this. But Case, you, you, pref- you prepared, I guess, little mini profiles for the class of 2022, if you want to get into it. Well, we've got four rookies in Japan right now. And I'm not going to include Takuma Nishikawa in this discussion. Although... As I will continue to remind people, do not sleep on Takuma Nishikawa, an underrated part of this. Now, look, I, I my understanding is he's going to be in Mexico still for quite a little while. Uh, perhaps in the summer and the early fall, we see him back in Japan making his Japanese debut. But we're going to ignore Takuma Nishikawa for the purpose of this discussion. What I do have is the four rookies of the class of 2022, Mochizuki Jr., Kaito Nagano, Yoshiki Kato, and Daiki Yanagiuchi. I have their floor and their ceiling using Dragon Gate wrestlers from prior Dragon Gate classes. All right, let's do this. And since he's been kind of the person we've been talking about a lot, let's talk with Mochizuki Jr. I th- and, and here's a question. Is his dad involved in the floor and the ceiling? No. No, he is Good. not. I'm, yeah, I'm I, glad. I'm glad. Here's here's where I'm at with Mochizuki Jr. I I think he is such an incredible special talent, and I, you know, look, I said it about Espy Kento, I said it about Fujiwara. I got there with Kamei while he was still very young, and Kamei still is very young. But in the context of this roster, he's basically a grizzled veteran. But Jr. just strikes me as somebody who cannot be ignored, and when I when I think about his floor. When I think about, you know, barring serious injury, the worst outcome of Junior's career, the worst case scenario, I think he's Naruki Doi. I think he's an incredibly charismatic guy who is a two-time Dreamgate champion, mind you, and that second reign, you know, really felt like Doi was the guy, the top guy in the company. It was a very special run, especially after the abortion that was his first Dreamgate reign. Sorry, Mike, I know you like it a little bit more than I do, but... A guy who is always in the mix, multiple-time Twin Gate champion, multiple-time Triangle Gate champion, multiple-time Brave Gate champion. For 20 years, Doi has been constantly in the mix. Even now as a freelancer, Doi is in the mix. I just proposed a future Brave Gate match for him. Two weeks ago, I was screaming about how, how is he not challenging for the Twin Gate belt at Champion Gate? He's changed characters. He's changed units. He's changed personas. But the consistent in Naruki Doi's career is that he's a guy in the mix. And quite frankly, I see that being the case for Mochizuki Jr. And I think the thing you would, just to like use one word to describe, uh, to describe a doy is pillar. He was a pillar that the company was based on from, for basically the last 15 years. But basically, I would say that blood generation was the elevation that made him into one of the key figures of the promotion. And, I can very easily see that for Mochizuki Jr. Like that seems so likely for him that like, you know, when we talk about these things, of course there, there will be the, the negative Nellies that immediately say they could have, they could all end up like Yamamura and that's true. But when I look at this and I will look at Mochizuki Jr. Doi makes just so much more sense with like how he is and like where his floor can end up being because look, he is someone that they are going to give shots to, like even if it if some things fail fail with uh, Junior, he is not going to be forgotten and cast aside, and that very much is the story of Naruki Doi. 
Yeah, no, Mochizuki Jr. is like Maude Apatow. It doesn't really matter who his father is. He's in this position because he's talented. And, and with work, I think he's only going to get better. And, and with that, I look at him and I look at like the other like big classes. Of course, 1997, the launch class year where you have where you have Shima, Sua, Don Fuji, Dragon Kid, and Magnum Tokyo. And your eyes naturally go to Shima for him, right? This oh, you beat me. I thought this was going to be my real hot take is that okay. I think the ceiling for Mochizuki Jr. is that he's this upcoming generation Shima. And look, I it's it's unfair to put this sort of pressure on a kid in the same way that, you know, literally after watching SB Kento's first match, I said, well, OK, they've got their next Yamato. Like I and felt confident saying that after match number one and three years later, I'm pretty locked in on that comparison. There's there's a real chance here that Mochizuki Jr. with the way that he's already emoting with a weight again, and I emphasize this a lot when we talk about him, the care that has been put into his booking, forget his talent and the way that he sort of overachieved. There was a level of care with him that is just not there with the rest of the roster. And that's not a knock on the booking. It's just a compliment towards the way that they've handled Jr. specifically. This is a guy who when you think about Shima, you know, I I think people like you and I, some of the uh, fans who have been fans for a long time now, the the image that always comes to my mind is outside of Fukuoka and Final Gate that one year where it's snowing and Shima's in his gear and he's giving this promo outside and these people are hanging on to every word he's saying, like he's a cult leader because he's Shima. He is a cult leader. That is actually his profession. He does wrestling on the side. Junior seems like a less crazy version of that. Like, I can see Junior being in that position. He's shy and timid now, but he's certainly more expressive than his father was through the first five years of Masaki Mochizuki's career. I don't see any reason why five years from now, Mochizuki Jr. isn't one of the leading promos in the company. And 10 years from now, I don't see any reason why he can't be the guy in a company with also Takuma Fujiwara and SB Kento, which is a lofty praise. That's all, that's the ultimate competition right there. Yeah, and the, the the other thing about applying like the Shima uh, comp to him is that with Shima, you have the fact that he was never planned on being that figure. <laughs> Whereas it, I think that if you sat down the decision makers in 1999 and say like, all right, here is your big, here's the career longevity and the arc of Shima. Shima would have been handled differently in the Crazy Max days, the early Crazy Max days. I think that's fair to say, Case? Yes. And with Mochizuki Jr., there's a chance to basically not have to do that, not have to build him up and be like the the fact that Shima... Shima dropped a good amount of falls in 98, 99. You know, like he was not protected in the way that I think that history seems to remember him as. No, Sua was protected and Magnum was the guy and Shima through a little bit of raw talent and a little bit of being an insane person, you know, catapulted himself into that number one spot. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I wrote this. Where where was I talking about Shima recently? I, uh, I don't even know. I wrote something for Voices of Wrestling dot com where I was talking about how I have a sick relationship with Shima where. Oh, it was the, it was the All Star Junior Festival review where he's a toxic individual. He alienates people. He's probably bad for everybody's mental health. I, we we know for a fact that President Okamura wasn't good for uh, everybody's mental health, and I would assume Shima wasn't much better. But I can't quit him. He's just a drug that I can't get rid of. I defend Shima constantly. And look, Torimon Drangate became what it became partially because of Shima. And when I think about the company of 2023 now, when I think about the company in, let's say, 2038, I have a real hard time imagining Mochizuki Jr. not being one of the top guys in the promotion. Yeah, no, I am with you on that. Um, let's talk about his the next person from the class to debut, Kaito Nagano. Kaito Nagano, of course, now the soccer playing flyer. Uh, interesting person to, I feel like, to apply comps because of his size. Yeah, and I also, you know, he was the hardest one for me because Kato, because of his size, I think it's very easy to draw comparisons there. Daiki, 
because of his nature, I, I very quickly came up with my floor to ceiling there. Junior took me a little bit of time, but Nagano, I really had to sit and think about, and I, I really had it, it, it became harder thinking about what Kamea has done over the last three years and thinking about what Minorita did last year. You know, when those two guys debuted, I was like, well, you know, God, they're going to be incredibly talented. But what are we going to do about their size? And they said, fucking relax, I got this. And and so Nagano, I haven't necessarily had that fear, but I really have to to recalibrate the way that I think about these wrestlers who are five feet tall, five foot one, five foot two, because there's clearly now a path to success for these guys. Whereas even in Drangate, again, three years ago, I was a little bit concerned. So my my floor here, my worst case scenario for Kaito Nagano at eight months into his career. I think that math is right. You know, still still very young, but very accomplished for what he's been given, uh, the opportunities he's been given. My floor for him is Kagatora. He's a guy that does cool moves. He's a guy who can hang in big matches, but he's a guy that doesn't move the needle at all. I, I think uh, that is unlikely, but also a realistic approach to looking at his career in the long term. So my mindset is similar but different. Mine is Sugi. <laughs> oh boy <laughs> um uh sugi the with, all good, the, with all the, the personal good. baggage attached well i mean you look at how sugi's career was and what what sugi now known as outside of you know his, his bad smuggling days a, a guy that does a lot of cool moves and has no impact yep and i could easily see that with nakano with like space world and his planches and that it could be very possible where Sugi, uh, I'm sorry, where Nagano is just going to be a, a gift magnet or someone in music video, like wrestling music videos, if you will. I think Estrella is more prime for that career than Nagano is. I, I think Nagano, even at this point in his career, just has a stronger grasp of fundamentals and just wrestling skill that for as much as I like Sugi, I don't think he's, Sugi at his peak, I don't think was as talented as Nagano is right now. Ah, oh, man, I don't know. Sugi has, has... I know if I'm watching a show of Sugi that for at least that match, I'm going to be thoroughly entertained. And I don't think that that's a bad floor to be at. No, no, not... I mean, look, that's why I kind of... That's why I kind of, like, throw Estrella's name in there because we've seen it. When Estrella hits, the dude's awesome. He just... His hit rate is so low, and I think that's a little similar to Sugi where, look, those good Sugi matches are really good, but those bad ones, oh my god. I just see enough in Nagano where I see that quality. Like, there's a little shakiness with him that if things go wrong, I could see that ending up that way. But let's not dwell on the negative. The ceiling for Kaito Nagano, I feel like, is going to be very interesting. I feel like that I've already shown a little bit my propensity to... To, to veer a little bit like take a hard left with you but i want to know where your ceiling is with him can i give a sugi fun fact real quick oh please do this will this will actually this will tie everything together i, I believe i am 98 percent sure that the 2008 incarnation of pwg's ddt4 tournament the team that was originally supposed to come over from el dorado was El Blazer, who was Sugi, and Kota Ibushi. And then Ibushi got hurt and Kagatora filled in. So if people don't know this, there is a, a DDT4 weekend where it is El Blazer and Kagatora versus the dynasty of Scott Lost and Joey Ryan. <laughs> uh, canceled, uh, and rightfully so. Uh, and then the second night, it is uh, Generico and Steen versus El Blazer and Kagatora. That match exists and I remember that being pretty decent. So I would recommend that if uh, if people haven't seen it. But my memory tells me that was originally supposed to be Sugi and Ibushi, and Ibushi had to pull out. Yeah, because I think that then they renamed it uh, Team Dragon Door, or maybe I'm thinking about a Chikara appearance with uh, Sugi instead. Yeah, I, they end up being billed as Team Dragon Door or Team El uh, El Dorado. Maybe I don't know somebody. I, I'm sure Alan remembers that or can can deep into the dig deep into the recesses of his brain and, and try to help us out there. I don't know if Tim Dog listens to the show or not. That might be something for him to look up. That seems like it's in his ballpark. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, for sure. But I'm pretty sure it was supposed to be Ibushi and Sugi and uh, Kagatora. In my opinion, the floor for Nagano 
was uh, the guy that ended up replacing him. My ceiling for Kaito Nagano, best case scenario. I mentioned the small guys that have had success, Kamea Minarita. I think the other guy that needs to be mentioned in this group, somebody who's had immense success. This is a great compliment, especially coming from me, somebody who's always been high on this guy. I think the ceiling for Kaito Nagano, with, with what we've seen of him in his career, is Dragon Daya. You know, somebody who is the glue when a six man tag, somebody who can be the highlight reel in a six man tag, somebody who can wrestle a competent singles match and have a great time. He can get his ass kicked, but he can fight back. He can come back. I think Dragon Dia is currently laying the blueprint for what could be the next 10 years of Kaito Nagano's career. And uh, I, I am glad that you did not bring up Dragon Kid because I like this comp a lot more than Dragon Kid because you have like the fresh face youngster. Like the very identifiable, like if you want to say skateboarding and uh, soccer, you know, like I, I would say youthful activity, you know? <laughs> sure, yes. <laughs> and like you look at how they fly, Kaito Nakano has already done things that kind of prove that uh, Lenny Leonard story, right? Where Dragon Daya could do anything that Hio Del Vikingo could do in 2020, but better. Like I could see that a lot. I, I, I really do like that. It, like that is probably very similar to it it this will sound weird but i could see it happening i see a little masato yoshino in nagano oh man that's i i guess i can see it it's it's not the direction that i would go yeah it's it's Less not the work. direction that i would go but i get where you're coming from right yeah it is something that hey if if you want to talk about having like a ceiling in a career I think there's maybe like 20 people listening to this show who turned out Masato Yoshino's career, you know, but it, it's something where like, I see certain through lines with him. I see like a certain like ease, like whenever you like, you see like him doing pros, like I, I like my Japanese is non-existent, but I can judge reactions and the reactions whenever Nakano has a microphone is a very similar, like kind of dry laughter that I, that I remember during the Doyoshi mic segments. You know, like Doi would always be like the very animated and just boisterous side. And then Yoshino always had like a like a dry line. And I kind of see that a little bit of Nagano, but even though he's he's hamming it up right now as a soccer enthusiast. God, that's interesting. I really I, I didn't I didn't think about it like that. I, I, again, I'm not fully there. I'm not going to co-sign on that, but that's an interesting thought experiment. Uh, can I get, can I give you a half baked take? do it okay i i have my parachute on i'm ready to eject from this immediately if if it doesn't vibe with you because as, as i'm building up to it i don't think i agree with it but i just you know what no i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna hold on to it i i've decided and they'll ramp up to this it's a it's a bad take i don't co-sign it i'm gonna bail on it and i think we're gonna move on to yoshiki kato all right, Yoshiki Kato. There's a couple of obvious ones here with the new generation power fighter. Uh, just like within the system, I mean, the the person that he reminds me most of, like, of course, there's going to be the obvious comp. I can very easily see the uh, Shuji Kondo floor for him. Okay, that you know, that's interesting. That's right where I've got him at. Is the floor is Shuji Kondo? a power junior who just never figured it out. And I say this as somebody who loves Shuji Kondo. I think his best matches, you know, his his best matches from 2000 to 2010 are up there with just about anybody's. But ultimately, Kondo never fully figured it out. And I think that's the worst case scenario for Kato is he has the look, he has the size, he's good, but he's not great in the ring. And it, we, you know, 15 years from now, we're going, God, it seems like he should have been better. Well, I mean, the thing of Kondo, you have uh, Agon Iso and the fact that Kondo, I think, is listed at 5'7", but he is probably at well over 100 kilos. So he can never make that jump when he's someone who very much needed to make that jump from junior to heavy. Yeah, I, look, he he was in the right position in the promotion that he was in. You know, he was built for Toriyaman and Drangate and lost the political battle. You know, I say it all the time. Look at the booking in the first half of 2004 when it's Toriumon, and then look at Kondo's booking when it becomes Drangate, and you'll see an immediate 
de-emphasizing of Agon Isu and of Kondo specifically. And, you know, he felt like he had to bail. And, you know, there's a million different stories to why it is or how it is that Agon Isu left. But ultimately, he left and it, it hurt his career in the long run because he was too big and powerful really to to be anywhere else. You know, I would have liked to have seen him bounce to Noah instead of all Japan. I think that would have been extremely interesting, but ultimately he just, he was always in the wrong place at the wrong time. And including now, I think, you know, now he's in this, you know, again, back in Dragon Gate, but he's too old to really have an impact. And it's unfortunate, an incredibly talented wrestler who just never put it all together. Yeah. And the other side of it is he went to all Japan, like the one promotion where I feel like there's a bit of a ramp. If you are a junior leaning heavy, be it with the tag titles and never had a world tag team run only all Asia with Yashi. So you, again, you get into that where it's just like things go different ways or best case scenario. And he makes that jump to full heavyweight and he's off to the races and, and he's never booked as strong as he was in early 2004, the rest of his career. No, never, never had a triple crown title defense. You know, the, the best success he saw is you're right. I mean, it's it's the first half of 2004. And then I guess wrestle one where he was office, but I, you know, I thought he won the wrestle one heavyweight championship and he did not. He doesn't even win the cruiser. No, that's 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 very strange. I, I will say I'm looking at this now. UWA World Trios champions. This is December 9th, 2016 through February 21st, 2017. Shuji Kondo, Jun Kasai, Nozawa Wrong Guy. I got to say, I do not remember that era of the UWA World Trios championships. Uh, you know, it's probably for the best with that, especially considering you see he has held the UWA Trios championships in three different companies. Wrestle one was so bad before strong hearts got there. Like that always blows my mind when people, and especially when it's not like dragon gate people, when it's just other puro fans who shade strong hearts, like you out of your fucking mind. These guys came into DDT and were immediately the best thing there. They came into Russell one and were immediately the best thing there. They have been awesome in all Japan and Gleet, for what it is, those guys are still very talented in the ring. But, like, you go back and look at a Wrestle 1 show from, like, 2014, it's so bad. That promotion sucked shit until Shima got there. I mean, just look at their first show. <laughs> and that tells I, think, you- I, 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 I think I want to do a 10-year retrospective on that this year because we're approaching the, the anniversary of it. The launch of Tokyo Dome City Hall, by the way, as well. What an, what an honor and that was i mean i was i was following japanese wrestling very i was very new to it at this time like i don't remember this show taking place but i i've heard you know a decade's worth of stories about it in the it, 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 you know ever since because there's great stuff on here like that koji kanamoto and minoru tanaka versus fujita hayato and masaki mochizuki it's like a four and a quarter star match. And then strong BJ versus Hayashi and Kondo was also really great. And then the main event is Bob Sapp and Keiji Muto versus Rene Dupree and Zodiac, who was Aaron Aguilera, who was, I believe, Carlito's bodyguard in 2004, 2005. Hey, hey, he stabbed John Cena. Allegedly. That's right. That's well, what a great angle. I, I, people make, but I was into that. That's a good, that's good storytelling right there. And then Kai versus Sonata. And I could do an hour right now on how Kai has had so much of a better career in the last 10 years than Sonata has. And that includes, you know, Kai's public humiliating failures. But ever since he's landed in Dragon Gate, you know, I'd take Kai's career over Sonata's any day of the week. I mean, when I see Kai showing up at places, I know something weird's going to happen. Whenever I see Sonata, I immediately go to Instagram to see what suit he wore. I can't, like... God, Sonata sucks. That's another guy. I hate to be so negative, but he (laughs) sucks. I just... There's people... Like, I always feel bad because Taichi has turned into a good wrestler, but he's just a wrestler I will never care about. I can't get into Taichi matches 
unless they're like the Will Osprey match from this year was great, but it was still I had to force myself to watch it because it's Taichi. But there are people that will put over Sonata still. It's like I can't f- fathom that he had bad matches with Okada. Nobody has bad matches with Okada. Yeah, it, it, I just always like think about like everyone's like, oh, I, I and I'm not dunking on Joe here. But like, remember when Joe was big on Sonata's going to win the G1 in 2018? Like, yeah, yeah, that was a dark time. Yeah, like that was like a common belief about this guy who, again, never more interesting than when he posts on Instagram. Straight up, great Instagram follower, instant bathroom break. No, the, bathroom. The, the best run of Sonata's career was the Big Japan strong climb that he did. Like, literally the weeks before he debuted in New Japan, because he debuted in New Japan in April of 2016, and this tournament was in March of 2016, and Sonata was so awesome. It was a little bit like when when Shingo went, uh, when he left Dragon Gate, and we were like, we're going to get Shingo and AAW and PWG and WXW. Shingo's going to go all over the world and do, you know, all Japan and big Japan and all these great things, and then he just wound up being a New Japan guy. And that was the first time that I think people saw light at the end of the tunnel at the end of the tunnel for Sonata's career where we were like, maybe he's a big Japan guy. And then he showed up in new Japan and, you know, has obviously been there ever since. And it's probably much happier that way, but his best in ring work is in big Japan. Imagine if he was in front of 300 people in a ice cold cork and hall getting That's paid, the- getting paid by Joey Bay's GoFundMe donation. He he might be able to take home some sweet potatoes too. <laughs> All right, what's what, what, what's Kato's ceiling? I think his ceiling is Sua, and it's easy to say Shingo. I certainly flirted with the idea of Ben K, but I'm really reevaluating the way that I think about Sua as a wrestler and his career. And I've been rewatching some of his footage, and he's a guy who I've I've enjoyed. You know, he's in great matches, but. I'm I'm appreciating him more now than I ever have. And I think, you know, this is the best comparison for Kato because he doesn't have that that just that natural fluidity that Shingo had from his first match on. I, I don't think he has even the fluidity that Ben K had as a rookie because Kato's good and he's better than I thought he would be in ring wise at this stage in his career. But he's still a little bit awkward. And I think he moves around the ring very similar to Sua. And it wouldn't surprise me if at some point, you know, if the Kato push comes, you know, Ben K went undefeated in King of Gate, but he was having, you know, big epic style matches. When the Kato push comes, he he might just run over guys in three or four minutes in the same way that Sua used to. And that is how we usher him into the main event scene. And Sua is such an interesting wrestler to watch. The crazy of crazy, Max. Like, it it was something that jumped out to me immediately about Kato. And we've seen them kind of break the mold a little bit with him. Uh, at least my expectation. That you look at him and you just think, oh, this is going to be like one of the more brutal people possible. And there's no one probably within, with the exception of Mr. Selfish Era Shingo, in the Dragon System as brutal and as wild as Sua. So I didn't even think of Sua before this. I, it, it was something with him and with Sua. Gosh, we got to do something about We should do a Sua series. Uh, really I, I agree. I, I was going to say a similar thing. I think, you know, at this point, the network is in early 2003 or late 2002, early 2003. The bulk of Sua's Dragon Gate career is now on the Dragon Gate network. And I think it's worth going back and looking at some of that stuff because I don't like... When does he leave Dragon Gate? Because he's there through the split, but he leaves in like September, doesn't he? Yeah, he pieces out near nearly immediately. Uh, Milan, uh, Magnum issues. Yeah, who would have thought? Okay, so he leaves. He leaves in August. He wrestles twenty matches, and is gone on August fourteenth, two thousand fourteen. His last match a two-on-one handicap match, Florida Brothers defeat Sua by DQ in 806. So he's doing he's doing nothing consequential by the time they get to Dragon Gate, with the exception of their first TV taping, that nine-man three-way that they did, Do Fixer, Italian Connection, and Crazy Max. 
So yeah, the the bulk of Sua's career, I mean, we'd be waiting on a match or two, but that's that's worth going back on one of these weeks where we don't have shows to talk about and looking at at his career because I don't know if a lot of people, let's say, if you you know came on board uh, the Drangate uh, fan base in the pandemic, there's no reason for you to have ever watched Sua matches, but I think there it's worth going back and checking it out. And it's something. So Sua does that first month. That first month is everyday pro wrestling. So not a lot of that was making the tape at that time too. Yeah, Other are they, than are like they highlights. doing? Uh, are they doing? Yeah, they are doing everyday pro wrestling that year. That's right. Um, yeah, because I wasn't launched... sure if that, if that started in two thousand four. If that was two thousand five. No, no, it was like right after they announced. I think it was the same press conference that they announced the split. They announced they were doing stuff at a die bus. So everyday pro wrestling for new listeners was something that they did for two years, basically as a way to great big outreach is the better way to do it. Odaiba is this giant man-made island in Tokyo that has theme parks, and they would do two matches a day there or thereabouts, and then doing like a special full card there for throughout the summer of 2020 or 2004. And there was like a big thing that like they had a show going on at Daiba at the same time as a Cork and Hall show. And Kanichiro Rai was sprinting from Odaiba over there and they made that into a storyline. <laughs> oh, that's so good. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. If you watch the Drangi uh, 2005 TV in order, it's weird because the first six months are like the greatest TV you've ever seen. And then after World, it it's two months straight of everyday pro wrestling shows. And like it's fine. There's good stuff there. Like Saito pin Shima in a in a singles match, the first Saito versus Shima singles match. And it's cool, but it's it just changes the the rest of the year is off because they spend so much time in Odaiba. Yeah, it's a pretty good reason why they don't do that anymore. All right, that leaves us with Daiki Yanagiuchi, of course, debuting last week. He did make an appearance on YouTube, didn't leave a whole lot of, didn't leave a, a, a impact for me on the on his performance, and it was Himejimi, or I'm sorry, Himeji, Himeji. Uh, how do you uh, figure him out here? His floor is Konami Shikawa. He's a comedy wrestler. Yeah, uh, I was going to say his floor was Anthony W. Morey, which is basically decently talented, but really known as a character person. But that's basically yeah. stalker of another vein, if you really want to think about it. I would I would actually make an argument that Morey might be his ceiling. I mean, I have a ceiling down as Rio Saito. If you cross out the Dreamgate run, we're talking a late stage Jimmy's and Beyond era Rio Saito. I think that's very fair for me. That was a guy who had big matches. You know, was was in the mix for a little bit, but wasn't somebody outside of the Dreamgate match with Yamato in 2013. Wasn't somebody that was really taken seriously at that point in his career. Hey, he was a middle school principal, and it was the funniest thing that I felt like Dragon Gate did for a couple of years at that time. Saito was the young boy was also pretty good. I just saw a photo of him in the black tights and the shaved head, and I that got old fast. But when that debuted, that was a very funny gimmick. Yeah, so I really, it's so hard to tell with him and with all like the different qualifiers with him, though, I think and that at least in Cork and Hall, he could be a one building guy at the very least. Yeah, I think that's fair. He's always going to be more over in Cork than he is anywhere else. And that is that is OK. That is a good thing to have in your back pocket. Yeah, and we'll probably get a better sense of him as we get to see him make more and more tape. But that's the uh, class of 2022. Uh, interesting class. I mean, I did not think that we were going to go Shima so quickly on Mochizuki Jr. case, but it kind of works out that way. Uh, no, I'm, I'm bummed. I thought that was going to be a real spicy take, and it ended up we, we were on the same page on a lot of these, which I, I wasn't expecting. Well, Case, I have prepared something for our last part of the show. Just have a question about for you right now before we get into it. Yes, go ahead. Are you ready to remember some guys? I am I'm ready to remember a guy. Give me one this week to close it out. All right. This is the one I had last week. This is brought to us by our friends at Mananichi Broadcasting System. Thank you for their help here. Uh, as we said on the first episode, remember this guy is an ongoing game where we remember a guy through playing a quiz. There will be six clues. They offer from not very helpful to basically telling you who it is. The first clue, as always, is the 10-point clue, and this is 
what era they're from. Case, this guy is from technically Torimon, Japan. Can you remember this guy for 10 points? Uh, well, I'm sorry, what era is he from? Technically, and that is a key point here, technically Torimon, Japan. Okay, play along at home. Let us know when you get this right. And the Voices of Wrestling Discord opened the Voice Gate channel. You said technically Torimon, Japan. My guess is Super Shisa. That would be incorrect a for five points. But he was super injured and ended up really making his debut in Torimon 2000 Project for five points. Oh, um, injured in the original class the it's not Takeshi Okamura is it no it is not let's continue probably you would consider them on the Ultimo side of the split uh an originally a Toriumon guy but came in in T2P is it brother Yashi no, and for three points, he has made rare Dragon Gate appearances. Brother Yashi was a roster member for a year, so yeah, has made rare appearances. Oh, um, okay, so let me make sure I have all this right. So, trained with Torimon Japan, correct, is, is associated with T2P, mm -hmm. was considered to be on the Ultimo side of the split. Mm hmm rarely wrestled in dragon gate since then he has made appearances but rare ones um okay i've got a guy in my head i've got a i can't i can't think of his name uh i gotta look him up on cage match real quick i gotta go to that first t2p show because i i don't think this is the answer i think you've stumped me but there's one guy that i'm thinking of that it could be and that man goes by the name of, shoot, where is he? That's a bummer. I thought he was going to be uh, more easily accessible than this. <laughs> that is a bummer. Okay, hold on. If, I, if I'm if i thinking of the right guy, am I thinking of all caps June, June Agayuchi? No, you are not. Huh. Okay. All right. All right. Your, your two-point clue is his nickname. And what I think, and I've said on the show, my favorite nickname in Torimon history, the Marshmallow Hedgehog. Oh, that, I, oh, God, I don't know. Uh, hmm. I, that, that, that should have been, I have no idea. Uh, this is where you got Ken 45 for two points last time. It's not... Uh, it's not Fukamasa, Philip J. Fukamasa. It is not Philip J. Fukamasa. Your last clue, the boss of Secret Base. I have no idea. Motosugu Shimizu is our remember this guy of the week. He was originally a member of Torimon Japan, but was super injured and ended up making his landing more so with T2P. Even though he is more considered like he's still listed as Torimon Japan. Stopped making appearances pretty soon after. Was, though, all in El Dorado and in Secret Base. And I think he made a Dragon Door appearance. His He did appear at one of the reunion shows. And does not really appear much more outside of that. His nickname, of course, Marshmallow Hedgehog. And he is the boss of Secret Base. You know, I consider him to be a Secret Base guy. It's a name that I obviously recognize. It's a name that... I don't I don't think he ever made tape in Dragon Gate. I mean, I'm looking at his cage match right now. And I might have I might have seen him wrestle in Torimon, Mexico. I don't think I've ever seen him wrestle in Japan unless it's for El Dorado. Super injured, like more injured than you and Ogagawuchi. Like I thought there was a lot of things here that like I when I try to do these case because I have the next two already ready to go. I try to have ones that when we get closer, it could either be one or another. Secret base is best identified with Yoon or Motosuku Shimizu. Well done, Mike. That stopped me. And I, I am curious to know if any of the listeners at home were able to get that. So let us know. Open the VoiceGate channel of the Voices of Wrestling Discord.
Yep, and that puts Case on the season. I'm preparing these by seasons, Case. Please. You're at, you're at two points. If you're ahead of Case on the season, let us know. And we will be back sometime in the future to remember yet another guy. But Case, unless you have anything else, let's get out of here. Nope, that's all I got. Like I said, Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern time, my Michinoku Pro retrospective will be live on VoicesOfWrestling.com. I would love to hear from people who have never seen, you know, any of those matches, haven't seen some of those matches, just want to rewatch those matches. I would love to hear from those people if they uh, if they check it out, because like I said, you know, Alan Forel years ago at this point posted a, a Michinoku Pro watch list on the Voices of Wrestling forums. It really impacted myself as a wrestling fan, as a viewer and what I learned to enjoy about wrestling. And I would hope to be able to do the same for somebody else. For sure. I can't wait to read it myself and probably rewatch that Haka Starlings match again. What am I saying? I'll watch that thing. It it might end up being one of my top five matches of all time. It's a five star match. I mean, it's it's certainly up there. You know, when I think about the greatest matches I've ever seen, I think about, you know, the Okada Omega stuff. I think about Kobashi Masawa from 2003, Shingo Mochizuki from 2015. Uh, Josephus and Tim Storm, Empty jo- Arena. Josephus and Tim Storm, Empty Arena, uh, Lucha Underground, uh, Brass Ring, Azteca, uh, Battle of Glory, uh, Choshu and Yasu versus Tenru and uh, Jumbo from January 1986. And then I think that Michinoku Pro match has to be in the conversation. God, I miss Starling so much. I do as well, my friend. I do as well. I- but that's going to do it for us this week. We'll be back next week talking about Memorial Gate and probably this this white hot Nagoya show. And we'll see how many things that case guests write from Nagoya. But you could follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you have a chance, go to uh, iTunes, go to Google Podcasts, go to Spotify, rate us five stars and leave a review. It's the best way to get more people to find out about the show. But again, that's Open Voice Gate on Twitter. Cases underscore in your case. I'm at Fujiheya. Thanks for listening to Open Voice Gate. We'll be back with you next week. Take care. Music. It's not just part of our daily lives. It's part of our wrestling fandom as well. And it has been for decades. That's where this show comes in. Music of the Mat, the podcast devoted exclusively to the music of pro wrestling. Hosted by Andrew Rich. Hey, that's me. Each episode delivers a different topic with a variety of great guests, fun conversations, musical analysis, and of course, a heartfelt pun or two. New episodes drop every other Tuesday on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcast app of choice. Check out Music of the Mat only on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Hello, Voices of Wrestling listener. Dave Ryan here. Have you ever wondered to yourself, how many hidden gems are hidden away inside the last years of World Championship Wrestling? Have you ever asked yourself how many tenuous gags can be made about the name Mike Enos? And have you ever thought about what it sounds like for two Irishmen to interpret a very chaotic company through its B-show? The answers to all this and more are just a click away. Check out Days of Thunder every second Thursday on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network.